Okay. Checking here. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? I can. Awesome. I can. You look great. <laughs> you look you look good. So I know you're gonna do a great job today. So uh, thank you. Yeah. Good. I like how you put yourself in a corner with no distracting things behind you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm moving today, so all of my walls are blank. <laughs> oh no, really? You had to do both of those on this. Oh man. That's so, tough. Uh, that's tough. Are you new apartment, new house? New apartment, new state. It's gonna be great. So where are you going to? Yeah, I'm going down to Utah. Oh, so. are you really? Okay. Yeah, I'm really excited. Now you're still with Clearwater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they moved me to fully remote, which is awesome. So. To where? Uh, fully remote. Fully remote. Oh. Okay, excuse mm -hmm. me. And where are you going to be living in Utah? Just south of Salt Lake. Wonderful. So, yeah, okay. I'm excited. That's good. Nice. Good. I like, uh, what is it, Utah Valley? That uh, wherever UVU and BYU are, they've got like COVID running crazy down there. So watch out for that. <laughs> Yeah, sanitizing hands. All yeah. That stuff. <laughs> awesome. Let me see. I think we're getting ready to join. All right, looks like it's 10 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to Resiliency in the Time of COVID, a discussion of resources and strategies for embracing change. It's my pleasure to welcome Britta Lines as our presenter. Armed with a BA in Middle Eastern Studies in Arabic, Britta is starting her post-college career as a high school Arabic teacher. When funding cuts killed the program after a single school year, she turned to data entry as she looked for a job that played to her strengths. In the process, she learned SQL and found her then dream job right under her nose as a data analyst. SQL led to Python and a job at Clearwater Analytics as a data engineer. 
And now four years later, she's in the process of becoming a software developer and starting career number three. There she is, Britta. Thank you for that. I'll go ahead and start sharing my presentation here. All right. So thank you. Uh, as has been mentioned, my name is Britta Lines, uh, and I'm a, a data engineer developer here at Clearwater. And my topic is resilience in the time of COVID. You'll notice from that introduction, though, I am not a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a therapist, or a doctor of any kind, nor do I play any of the above on TV, <laughs> nor do I claim to have had the hardest life of anyone in this room. Uh, there's lots of people who've been through a lot of different things. So why listen to me? Well, I am a learner and a researcher, and I'm very passionate about resiliency, as kind of has been alluded to. There's been several points in my life where I had I had to ask the question, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to push through, bounce back? And one of those things that all of us kind of have in common is COVID-19, where with this pandemic, we've all been impacted differently, but we've all been impacted. And that gives us a common thread that we can talk about things like coping and resiliency with a familiar context. So my goals today are first to present ideas and research regarding resiliency and spark conversations about coping with COVID-19 and beyond, because there's the, the tactics that apply for COVID also apply for many things in our lives. I'm a language nerd. So starting off with the definition. Back in 2013, the International, I have to say this slowly, the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies <laughs> took an anthropologist, a child psychologist, and three stress and trauma specialists, threw them in a room and asked them to define resiliency. What came out was a marvelous paper about resiliency and its different definitions, different aspects of it. So I've worked a lot of those definitions in throughout the, uh, <laughs> throughout the talk, but I wanted to start off with the most detailed, the most technical. Resilience refers to the capacity of a dynamic system to adapt successfully to disturbances that threaten the viability, the function, or the development of that system. Keyword here being adapting successfully. That's the goal here. With these different definitions, the panel also gave a caveat that's kind of important to have up front. There isn't a right or perfect way to cope. It all depends on the situation. It depends on who they are, who's going through the situation, what happened to them, and what the situation is. So, for example, I could give you all sorts of studies about specifics like cross-stitch that it will lower blood pressure. For me, it actually doesn't. I enjoy it, but it does not lower my blood pressure. <laughs> so, while I will, I do have some specific things to, that to suggest. Most of this is in the way of general ideas that you can then zero in on to find what's actually going to work for you. So the structure of my talk today: find your guiding star, but don't get involved in a land where you can't win. <laughs> Build your support system. After all, where would Humvee without you? Uh, and lastly, leverage the power of change. Change is the new normal. We talk a lot about that right now, but it's also in many ways the old normal, and it's important to recognize that. So diving right in, find your guiding start, but don't get involved in a land where you can't win. The idea of finding a guiding start comes from this quote from Ozzie Davis. We can't float through life. We can't be incidental or accidental. We must fix our gaze on a guiding star. That gives you the way to understand where you are and why it's important for you to do what you can do. I love that phrase, fix our gaze on a guiding star. And if you would take a moment and think about what the guiding star or stars are in your life. Maybe it's an overarching goal. Maybe it's a way of life. If you're the Mandalorian, this is the way. Whatever it is, I many times we'll, they'll actually change a little bit over time. It's kind of been as alluded to. I was at one point an Arabic teacher. That was my goal in life, but then I am now becoming a developer and that's my goal in life. That's good. My family has always been my rock. I have a code of ethics, whatever it is that, that guides you and provides direction and meaning in your life. And if nothing comes to mind when you hear the phrase guiding star, that's great because it means you get a chance to architect your life, to decide where you wanna go, what you wanna do. And as has been mentioned, it may change over time. Now, as you assess or reassess your guiding star or stars, I, I would submit one idea to include. Uh, this comes from Dr. Catherine Panterbrick. She spent over a year with Afghani war refugees, asking them about psychological resiliency, what they were doing. She refers to it as the drip, drip, drip of multiple everyday stressors, everything from the war that they were dealing with to family conflicts, uh, 
community problems. She says, in that sense, resilience is about making sense of the moral aspects of your life. But Afghans will also tell us that what matters most in life is sustaining a sense of hope and dignity. So as you think about the guiding stars, I hope that in there, there's some things that bring you hope and dignity. Diving right in. I do not claim to be a Napoleonic scholar, but he was too good a, a, an example to pass up. I love this quote from Napoleon Bonaparte, until you spread your wings, you'll have no idea how far you can fly. He truly flew far. As a, a Corsican, he was actually a minority in France and it kind of colored parts of his life. He, he was a little bit of an outcast as a schoolboy. He got into the artillery as artillery of the French Revolution. French, <laughs> slowing down here. Uh, he became a, an artillery officer in the French army and distinguished himself during the French Revolution. He actually was a brigadier general by the age of 24. With He was on the councils with the highest levels of government in the French Revolution, which is ironic because very quickly, in 1799, he actually staged the coup that ended the French Revolution and installed him as the first consul and then emperor. What followed was 10 years of war. Uh, he expanded France dramatically, and it wasn't until he faced the combined British and Russian forces with their allies that he was forced to retreat back to Paris. When he got there, he discovered that the British and his people had formed a treaty, and he was the price for peace. So he and his closest allies were exiled to the island of Elba. And I think it's a good time to bring in the second quote from him. One must change one's tactics every 10 years if one wishes to maintain one's superiority. He had been forced to abdicate, he had been exiled, and he changed his tactics. He and his generals actually staged a second coup, came back, and the same people who had threatened to throw him in, in ch chains and uh, cages, actually welcomed him back with open arms as the Emperor of France a second time. It didn't last particularly long. Uh, after another 100, 111 days, he actually suffered a second devastating loss. The Battle of Waterloo did not go his way. And the British were taking no chances this time. They exiled him to the island of St. Helena's, which is a tiny, tiny island about halfway between South America and Africa. And he died there six years later, presumably due to the situations of his imprisonment. So this is a man who flew very far. He had his, his guiding star, he called it his lucky star. And he did incredible things, but his ending isn't quite what I hope for for all of us. So how do we keep that momentum? Well, for that, I turn to Sun Tzu. If you haven't read his Art of War, it is a marvelous book considered for millennia as the seminal work on military strategy. And it's a fun read. Um, my favorite quote from Sun Tzu, choose the sunny side. <laughs> it's a great all-purpose quote, but a little bit more applicable today is, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. In this context, Sun Tzu is addressing generals whose guiding star, whose goal is very clear. They want to win a war. And to do that, they need to win the battles. His advice on how to win battles is relatively simple know the enemy, know their situation, their tactics, their resources, but also know yourself, your resources, your tactics. Sometimes that self-introspection can be a little bit painful. Maybe that's just me. But as we do, and as we're honest with ourselves, we can accurately assess the situation. In 2018, the BMC Health Service Research Group asked 68 medical professionals what they did to maintain psychological resiliency. And on this topic, there's this great quote. You have to be generous with yourself about mistakes. I think mistakes are always going to happen. So divorce the emotion from it and be honest. Mistakes are gonna happen, but we have to be honest about that. Additionally, again from Sun Tzu, one may know how to conquer without being able to do it. Sometimes we know the path, but we don't have the resources. Or I actually prefer Picard's way of saying this. It's possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness, that is life. So as we accurately and honestly assess our side of the battle, we then move on to accurately assessing the other side. The common enemy that, that we're using at, for context today is COVID. Um, and earlier this year in April, a group of doctors got together to assess the situation and discuss what the likely outcomes of this pandemic would be. It should be emphasized that distress and anxiety are normal reactions to a situation as threatening and unpredictable as the coronavirus pandemic. 
keywords that stuck out to me, stress and anxiety are normal reactions in a situation like this. Two of the, the outstanding aspects that many of us have experienced are stress and isolation, which have been studied for a very long time and are known to potentially cause some very serious adverse effects. Everything from immunosuppression, hypertension, dyslipidemia, osteoporosis, increased heart rate and blood pressure, hypercortisolemia, atherosclerosis, or specifically around the pandemic, changes in concentration, irritability, anxiety, insomnia, reduced productivity, interpersonal conflicts. I don't want to dwell on all of these, but they are significant. And it's important to have that understanding of what the enemy is, of what it is that we're facing, so that we can accurately attack back, so we can accurately move forward. So how do we move forward? Well, I would suggest build your support system. After all, where would Han be without Chewy, Lizzie Bennett without Jane and Charlotte, Spock without Kirk and McCoy? On the topic of resiliency, Dr. Ann Matson said, much of resilience is embedded in close relationships with other people. She specifically calls out early childhood, but then expands it for all of, all of our lives. Those relationships give you a profound sense of emotional security and the feeling that someone has your back because they do. So who has your back? Whose back do you have? Who's in your social support network? And who should be? The National Cancer Institute defined a social support network, a network of family, friends, neighbors, and community members that is available in times of need to give psychological, physical, and financial help. I like to think of it as a safety net. Who's in the safety net? Who should be? The one person that I would, I'd like to start off by calling out, a competent medical professional. These are a few of my favorites. Someone who understands the, the physical and the psychological aspects of what we're, we're going through, at whatever it is at the time, whether it's COVID or another challenge. It's important to have them in the picture. It's important to have people who listen, people who talk, people that we can talk through what's going on with. And this has a significant impact on our lives. During the Vietnam War, which has kind of become synonymous in some ways with PTSD studies, they found after controlling for trauma exposure, they found that Vietnam veterans with high levels of social support were 180% less likely to develop PTSD as compared to those with low levels of social support. So after making sure that they were comparing equal levels of trauma, they were 180% less likely to develop PTSD if they had a high levels of social support. I was curious about this. War is, is very large, it's very traumatic. What about little things? Uh, so <laughs> in a more recent study, they asked for volunteers to come in and do what I consider minor form of torture. <laughs> they asked them to perform mental arithmetic and public speaking on the fly in front of people. What they found was in laboratory studies, mental arithmetic and public speaking tasks cause significantly smaller rises in heart rate, blood pressure, and cortisol among subjects supported by another person compared to subjects who are alone. Just having someone there was enough to physically or to change the physical response to stress. This is also applicable over time. A 10 year longitudinal study found that social support from partners promoted resilience in response to economic stress. Financial stress is one of the hardest things that we face and just having someone there over time made a significant difference. The last person I wanna call out as being key to your social support network, the captain of this war, the general, <laughs> the general of this war, the captain of this enterprise, got my, my quotes mixed up, is you. Uh, as Catherine Fenderbrick puts it, I would define resilience as a process to harness resources in order to sustain well-being. You're the, the traffic flow engineer. What resources do you have? What opportunities do you have to increase and sustain well-being? Returning to the 2018 study or survey of uh, medical professionals, 63% listed support from colleagues as key to maintaining psychological resiliency. Similarly, 63% support from family and friends. My favorite, 66% engage in leisure activities. <laughs> you have a good hobby, so you don't end up talking about work all day every day. I'd switch this up a little bit. Have a good hobby so you don't end up talking about COVID all day every day. Uh, if you feel like it, if you feel comfortable with it and are interested in sharing, we would love to hear about COVID hobbies. If you picked up a new skill or a puppy, whatever it is that's helping you cope, uh, keeping in mind that what works for one person might not work for another, we'd, we'd love to hear about it. 
and we'll circle back to those in the chat afterwards. Uh, one thing that I've been working on, regular exercisers have an increased ability to maintain a more positive mood, helping insulate against stress. I love that idea of being able to insulate against stress. Returning to the survey, highest percentage, 84% cultivate a good work-life balance. Try to switch off as much as possible. Try not to bring too much home if possible. This is really difficult right now because many of us are either remote or partially remote. It's hard to switch off, but maintaining that mental switch of this is work, this is home can really help bring a sense of balance. Well, this is great, but can we really change? Can it really make an impact? <laughs> Which leads me to the, the last portion of my talk. And we're gonna stop and do a live demo. This is a little bit less dangerous because I'm not actually deploying any code, but <laughs> it does require a little bit of audience participation. Uh, you can throw it in the chat if you want, or just uh, thinking about it. If you would with me, think of a time where you faced a challenge. What skills did you use to get through it? What skills did you learn? And the second piece, have you used those skills again? And if the challenge was waking up this morning, I totally, totally get that. That's, that's a valid challenge. <laughs> if you've used those skills a second time, if you've continued to, to incorporate them into your life, you've already leveraged the power of change. From Dr. Rachel Yehuda, resilience involves an active decision that must be frequently reconfirmed. That decision is to keep moving forward. I love this. In those challenges that you were thinking of, you chose to keep moving forward, and I hope that you continue to keep moving forward. That choice is part of resiliency, and it's a key piece. Can it make a difference? That leads me to the next study. In 2016, a group of Chinese researchers from multiple universities came together to study a fascinating topic. They wanted to study hope. So what they did is they took three groups of mice and asked them <laughs> Or, and had them, excuse me, <clears throat> they didn't ask the mice anything that wouldn't have helped very much. They had three groups. The first was the control group and they got the easy task. They could just run around, have fun, do the mazes. The second group, they taught helplessness and the third group, they taught hopefulness. So how they taught the learned helplessness mice was they attached electrodes to their legs and for six days, they gave them no escape there were periodic uh, signals of pain to their legs with no hope. It, it just was going to happen. What they found after six days was compared to the control group that were running around with no pain, they actually had spatial memory deficits. They weren't able to work the mazes as quickly as their, the control group. And to the point where they, they wouldn't escape even if they could. They had decreased neural connections. The third group is most fascinating to me though, the learned hopefulness mice. They were actually trained how to escape. They had the same number and intensity of shocks, but there was a way to escape and they were shown how to do it. These, this group compared again to the control group had enhanced spatial memory. They were faster. They were better at escaping the situations, getting through the mazes. They had enhanced neural activity. They grew their brains. They took this, this opportunity and this challenge to, and, and pushed through it and learned from it. I thought this is fascinating, but this is mice. Can humans really do this? Well, this leads to the science of neuroplasticity. The brain can change its own structure and function through thought and activity. This is fascinating to me. You might be a little bit more familiar with the term growth mindset. Um, the brain is like a muscle that grows stronger and smarter when it undergoes rigorous learning experiences. We can grow our brains. We can, can increase our abilities. Now, how do we do this? Well, an individual's intellectual abilities can be developed in response to efforts, taking on challenging work, improving one's learning strategies, and asking for appropriate help. I love this quote because it's basically a four-step how to grow your brain. Effort, hitting the challenges head on, using different learning strategies. If flashcards aren't working, try something else, asking for appropriate help when needed. But does it work? So in 2014, or sorry, 2015, Multiple groups came together and formed the National Study of Learning Mindsets. Their goals were relatively simple. They wanted to reduce negative effort beliefs, the idea if I have to try hard, 
or ask for help, it means I'm not good at something. They wanted to reduce fixed rate attributions. If I fail, I'm not good at it. I have a set IQ, things like that. And finally, reduce performance avoidance goals. I don't wanna look stupid. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else, but I relate to these goals. These are things I would like to reduce in my life. Well, their methods were simple. First, introduce growth mindset, exactly what we've been talking about. Second, teach effort and strategy revision as tools for brain growth. So who did they get for this experiment? Well, 12,490 ninth graders from 65 US public schools. They gave them less than an hour of training, which boiled down to exactly what we were talking about. Brain is like a muscle that grows stronger and smarter when it undergoes rigorous learning experiences. What they found was startling though, a 0.1 GPA increase, not just across core GPA, English, math, gym, but specifically held true again across math and science. In fact, in 10th grade, they saw an increase in enrollment in advanced math and science. The caveat with this is those teenagers whose peer group did not have this training, did not believe in growth mindsets, did not have as strong gains. So that support group is key. I was, I was curious about this. So I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into neuroplasticity. The next few examples come from a book from Dr. Norman Deutsch, The Brain That Changes Itself. First example is Emma and the Adaptive Brain. In five years, she did what is a goal of a lifetime for me. She went through the entire works of Dostoevsky, uh, Tolstoy, Dickens, Chesterton, Hugo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All while blind. Emma had a degenerative eye disease that caused her to go blind in her 20s. And in order to keep in touch with the books that she loved, she got a text-to-speech program. <laughs> and as many of us have found as we do, you don't, uh, excuse me, Udemy courses or other text-to-speech style things, uh, she could increase her speed a little bit and then a little bit more and a little bit more. She got to the point where she was going through multiple thick novels per day in her spare time just for fun and not just listening, but analyzing and understanding, comprehending and, and comparing these books that she was reading. And because she was a friend with, with Dr. Joyce, she went to him and said, now, how can this work? I couldn't do this before I lost my sight. What happened? He said, well, the, the brain is plastic. We can grow, we can adapt. Another example of this, tactile vision. I love this. This is actually a later prototype. It's a little easier to understand from an earlier prototype. Uh, the thing that looks like a torture machine, <laughs> it consists of several pieces. So there's the camera that takes images and turns into the, the pixelated images you see on the side. And it translates those pixels, those pixelated images into a physical representation of pixels on someone's back, which is the, the chair that you see. So it's kind of like having someone write a, a letter on your palm, only it's kind of stamped all at once. The purpose of this machine was they took people who had never been able to see, people who had been blind from birth. And conventional medical thought at the time was that because these people had never had to process images, their brain would not be able to understand. What they found though, was after several sessions of getting used to the machine and the weirdness of having images projected on your back, when people walked in the room, they would actually recognize them based on these images. Or if you threw a ball towards the camera, they'd duck because they knew the ball was coming the brain adapted to the point very quickly that it could use those images. So I'll go back to the previous slide because it's cool. <laughs> this is a next generation uh, prototype where instead of having the pinpricks on the back, it's actually on the tongue and the camera is much smaller. It's actually in its helmet. So my final example, Dr. Bar Barbara Aerosmith Young. She was a young woman who faced enormous challenges. She was born with an asymmetrical brain that caused her to have dyslexia and an inability to grasp relationships, symbols. Uh, clocks were especially difficult, not digital clocks, but analog clocks with hands. Uh, prepositions, relationships between people, the idea that my father's brother is my uncle. She could memorize facts, but she didn't understand the, the meaning behind them. So she memorized her way through high school and through college and was working her way through uh, her next levels of education when she decided that it was time to make a change. Instead of practicing compensation, 
she exercised her most weakened function. In this case, she chose clocks, which may seem like a little bit of a trivial example, but it was what was bugging her. So she had a friend help her and they made hundreds if not thousands of flashcards of clocks. At the end of many exhausting weeks, not only could she read clocks faster than normal people, but she noticed improvements in her other difficulties relating to symbols and began for the first time to grasp grammar, math, and logic. She hit the problem head on and found that it improved there, but also the related areas that she had struggled with. I wanted to, to circle back to the growth mindset <laughs> slide here. It's these examples where people take the effort, they hit the problems head on. And if one thing isn't working, you try a different strategy and ask for help when, when needed. Now, moving forward, hopefully coronavirus won't be with us forever. Hopefully we'll find a new normal. What does this mean for us in the future? Well, as Dr. Rachel Yehuda points out, according to statistics, we know that the probability of trauma occurring is high. We must prepare early on. We're in the middle of a traumatic situation now, but, but more trauma will likely come. A culture that expects to have to deal with adversity will deal with it better, whether that's an individual culture or a team or a family culture, a company culture or a national culture. If we're preparing for these things and we're used to this process of adapting, we will be able to adapt better. How do we go about that? Well, find your guiding star, have a goal and analyze how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Build your support system. What resources do you have? Who's your support system? Who, whose support system are you a part of? And finally, leverage the power of change. When you have those things that you want to change, hit them head on. I wanna close with my final and favorite definition of resiliency. If you had to boil down resilience to just one single word, that word is hope. And with that, I'll open it up. If there's any questions in the chat or If not, I think we're good. All right, I would, I'm putting a link in the chat room for a survey for, oh, we have some questions. Oh. <laughs> All right, so Britta, the first question is, what was your favorite part of preparing for this talk? Uh, I got to learn a lot of things and honestly, it. They've been very useful for me <laughs> lately uh, with the changes. I think I mentioned earlier before we started, I'm actually moving today. So I've been able to apply it and learning about the science behind why resiliency is important and how it works was absolutely fascinating. If, if you're interested in this topic, there's a lot of good research out there and it's really fun to read. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> All right. Thank you all so much for, for coming and attending. And if you have any questions or any further feedback, I would love it. Um, I th think that my email's out there. So <laughs> uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime.